Um, if you want to make money at some point, remember this, because this is one of the reasons startups win. Big companies want to decrease the standard deviation design outcomes because they want to avoid disasters. But when you damp oscillations, you lose the high points as well as the low. This is not a problem for big companies because they don't win by making great products. Big companies win by sucking less than the other big companies. So if you can figure out a way to get into design war with a company big enough that it's software designed by product managers, they'll never be able to keep up with you. These opportunities are not easy to find, though. It's hard to engage a big company in design war, just as it's hard to engage an opponent inside a castle in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It would be pretty easy to write a better word processor than Microsoft Word, for example, but Microsoft, within the castle of their operating system monopoly, probably wouldn't even notice if you did. The place to fight design wars is in new markets, where no one has yet managed to establish any fortifications. That's where you can win big by taking the bold approach to design and having the same people both design and implement the product. Microsoft themselves did this at the start, so did Apple and Hewlett Packard. I suspect almost every successful startup has. And that's from one of Paul Graham's essays, and he has those kind of collected into that book, Packers and Painters. That's a, a great book to read if you're interested in um, software development. More specifically, kind of what I'm going to talk about today, because it's kind of what I do, is startups. And if you're interested in startups or want to learn more about them, it's a great place to go. Um, so what else? Oh, these are questions I had to slide deck together for class. Uh, but uh, yeah, what path that takes you around today? Starting a business, the right thing to be a software developer. One of the interesting things that have happened for you. So those things I'm going to try and answer today. Kind of slow down. So that uh, chapter one. I did kind of mention uh, kind of my before high school and stuff. Uh, I actually, my, you know, my first job was here, as first job as a software developer was here in Stillwater. I worked for Kubner Associates, for Russ Kubner, uh, who's one of the big um, computer science alumni. And back in the day, he was, you know, the mainframe in the library was not able to be online, and so he wrote some software to actually put the, take the main mainframe and, and create HTML and, and put it on the web. So that's one of the products I worked on. Uh, but from there, I you know, took a job offer coming out of college to work at Williams up in Tulsa in a oil, gas, and pipeline company. And it was the first step in me trying to figure out what type of computer scientist I am. And you know, one of the key takeaways I'd like you guys to think about is what type of computer scientist you are and what career path. Uh, that goes. It took me a few years to figure that out. Uh, Williams, I would say, kind of a typical big company uh, with good benefits, good pay, eight to five, you show up in your khakis and polos and you sit down and you work on uh, financial stuff for them and pipeline stuff and maybe every few years you get to write something new. Uh, you have a guy that is in charge of database naming. So anytime you want to add a column to a database, you have to get the column name approved by this guy. And so he does all that stuff. And so the upside is, is a good job, good money. Uh, the downside is not very exciting, and I did not fit in well there. And that's kind of my first time I decided to try something different and went to a startup company. And one of the reasons I went to a startup company is because I like to do lots of different things. I like to, to have a hand in everything from you know, the PR and marketing of a product to training and teaching people how to use the product on top of my regular software development stuff. And so I went to work for a startup and figured out that I really like working with startups. Yeah, and so I bounced around to different startups. I'd say bounced around. I worked at one. We went through the dot-com bust and got laid off. And so I went to work for uh, another company, found a good job, uh, named, um, it's eventually ended up at E-Links Technologies in Tulsa. And they do natural gas, they do monitoring natural gas field equipment, which does not sound very interesting just right off the bat. But 
the time I worked there, it was a new, they, Microsoft had just released their .NET framework and introduced ASP.NET. And so making that transition from ASP to the ASP.NET environment turned out to be something really cool because we got to build this whole system from the ground up. And if you're familiar with, it, with any of the little gas technologies, there's a thing called SCADA, which is supervisory control and data acquisition. So all the stuff, oil, gas, talk SCADA, and they have SCADA systems, and these are all big computers, and they have a big room with big monitors and all this stuff. So there's no way to get that online, but that's what we need for. So it was, it was really great job. They're still going strong today. Uh, but it was fun because I got to do all sorts of neat stuff uh, with that and the new web technologies, bring that all, all stuff we take for granted now uh, with the new frameworks and all sorts of things. But what happened was eventually, yeah, I got tired of doing that. And I worked for another company and they went bankrupt and I ended up doing contracting for all these big customers. And along that time, around that time, it was about 2009. There's a company in San Francisco called Twilio. And Twilio, I'm familiar with Twilio or not, but Twilio provides APIs for making phone calls and making receiving phone calls and sending and receiving text messages. And before this, it was really difficult and expensive to do this on your own because you had to buy all these little cards to plug in computers and it was a pain in the ass and you couldn't do it easily. But Twilio made it easy to do, just with a line of code and some text messages. <coughs> yeah, pretty awesome. So it was something that, you know, we have, um, oh, what are they called? Like uh, the weekend, the coding, coding bank, and um, yeah, you'll show up on like Friday and everybody breaks into groups and do coding for the weekend. It's a really kind of best problem. I did a few of those, and Twilio kept coming up, and I kept working on Twilio. And at the time, they introduced, when Twilio introduced their text, their SMS API, they started running developer contests. And they're based on San Francisco, and these were world, worldwide contests. And so one, one time, they had a development contest going on for SMS. And I happened to be like on a business trip in Chicago, and I had some extra time sitting in the hotel room and on the flights. And I thought back to a time when I was in Hawaii, and I was, you know, at Waikiki Beach, and it was dinner time. We we're gonna go grab some dinner, and so we went to a restaurant like a block away from Waikiki Beach, which is just, you know, a gorgeous beach. And we got there, and they said, "Yeah, it would be about an hour away." And I was like, "That's cool. You're like down from the beach." But then they gave you the buzzer beater, and they say, "Well, you can't go like 100 feet away." So here we are in Hawaii, a block away from a gorgeous beach, and you're stuck there at the restaurant. It's just a big buzzer paper that you can't go too far away. Well, I used that as inspiration and created what I named uh, Waiting for a Table. And what Waiting for a Table is, is a wait list for restaurants and you a text message when your table's ready. And we kind of take that for granted now, but at the time when this technology was new, this was... Uh, Pretty cool stuff. I ended up winning the contest and got some great uh, PR and press out of it. So they made the announcement of uh, I won the contest, a couple of other things picked up, uh, news stories about it. Uh, I had it, I had restaurants calling me that week wanting to use it, and I had it in a restaurant within two weeks uh, a restaurant actually using it, going from something that I just wrote in a hotel room over a couple days to inside a restaurant being used within like two or three weeks, which is uh, pretty fun. I decided to you know, add new functionality to it and I ended up launching that as Diner Connection in September of 2010. And I have had paying customers from day one. Uh, so I had people signing up with people that were you know, beta uh, using the product. And so that's been a pretty fun ride with that. Whenever I launched that and got the press, I started, um, at the time, I was a uh, Microsoft BizSpark customer, which if you're looking at doing startup, doing it, even if you're not using Microsoft technologies, and uh, they have a great support system in the Microsoft BizSpark program where you get free Microsoft products for like three years and plus uh, Azure credits and stuff. It's a really cool product, uh, program, but 
Uh, Microsoft picked this up as a uh, startup of the day for the Microsoft BizSpark program. And so they put a nice article from Microsoft, which is cool. And then from there, uh, Mashable picked this up, uh, wrote an article about Diner Connection, and also uh, Fast Company included some of their uh, stuff in there. And uh, I guess the, the top, I think, pinnacle I got was uh, being mentioned in the Wall Street Journal uh, for Diner Connection. So this is actually a picture of it being used uh, in a restaurant in Oklahoma City. And it was you know, one of the articles for, I think it was in Tulsa World and uh, the Oklahoma City newspaper as well. So it's using it on the app. I've uh, been named one of 50, best 50 apps for restaurant <coughs> managers. So, and people ask me, well, how do you, you know, how do you get all that press? You know, you wrote this app in, you know, a couple of days and you launched it and you got some, you, but, and then you achieve all this great PR and press and customers. And, and uh, the simple answer that I tell them is, is just hustle. Because like with the Microsoft thing, I pestered them, I emailed them, I, I you know, tweeted them saying, hey, you know, feature us as a, as a uh, startup of the day. And they, they eventually gave in, and that was kind of the first one. And then once I got that first article from Microsoft, uh, I got uh, sent that to Mashable and said, hey, you, you need to do an article on me. And then from there, after a couple of them, you know, people started calling us about uh, writing articles in press and PR. And that's where I picked up most of my customers was from the media exposure that we had, and not through paid advertising or direct, direct marketing or anything like that. And so the media has been good. Um, one of the things that happens is when the people see this and they say, oh, that's a really cool idea, but now we take it for granted and go to a restaurant and they, you know, send us text messages. And unfortunately, that's not all diner connections because I do have a lot of competitors now. But we have, but I have interesting people that see what I've done and they start contacting me and saying, I really like what you did. I have this idea for blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure when people hear that you're a programmer, you have people saying, hey, I've got this great idea for now, you know. Um, and it, the more exposure you get, the more people like that you get. Oh, this is a great idea for now. Um, but every once in a while, you talk to somebody really cool who has this great idea that really is a great idea for an app. One of the people that saw my uh, Diner Connection product uh, happened to be a a lead singer in a band out of Austin, Texas, uh, called Alpha Rev, and his name is Casey McPherson. Well, Casey has, uh, at his concerts, he has a merchandise table, like most artists do, and had a sign-up sheet for email list. And so one of the big ways that he keeps in touch with his fans is through email. And his pain was getting all these email addresses from people at concerts. And a lot of times, being a, a band not as well known as other bands, he would open for this band. So you get it to a place where they don't know who the opener is, you get in front of an audience, and they play, play, and they like you. And then you say, come to my merchandise booth table, get your email, write your email address down so we can keep in touch and so you can you know, buy CDs and stuff in the future and we'll let you know when we come back around. As you can imagine, you might have been to a concert or two and, and maybe uh, maybe have some drinks at a concert, and maybe you don't have good handwriting in the first place, but when you have people write all their email addresses down on a sheet of paper, uh, not everybody shows up to write their email address down, and then somebody has to read it and then type it in. <coughs> Big time waste. And so his idea was what we ended up naming Scofflash, which was the easiest and fastest way to gather email addresses from an audience in person. And what happens is you, as an artist, this is Casey here on the left, my partner in Scott Flash. Uh, you're in front of the audience and you ask them, hey, everybody pull out your phone. And a lot of times now, everybody's phone's already out. Uh, send your email in a text message to this number here and you'll get your email address. And that's exactly what it uh, did. I had a video, but I'm not online. But it was Casey, and you just imagine him in the front of Kane's Ballroom up at Tulsa and ask him. Uh, so it, it, um, in that video, we actually had, uh, I think, like 300 so email signups in less than two minutes, which is something that you just can't do with you know, paper or anything else. So as part of all that, Diner Connection and Scott Flash and other things, that actually created a company to you know contain all these uh, software products that actually operated under. 
and I uh, and I named it Moxie Software because I thought it was a cool name. Uh, and so one of the things that goes along with startups and running your own company is unfortunately um, lawyers, which sucks. Uh, but other people are not fun to deal with too. So I had this logo and a great logo. I had people design it. I have the domain moxysoftware.com. You know, I have the the, uh, the trademark name Moxie Software, and it's just registered in the state of Oklahoma, which is fine. Um, but things you have to deal with as a company owner, and this not just software, but happens to be my software company. Um, but in the beginning, I you know. My crappy design was that, you know, you could, you know that was my crappy uh, logo design. This is why I hired somebody to do logo design. It's great to outsource because you got sourcing stuff that you don't like. But anyway, it was a crappy logo, but it was my logo, and I liked it. Um, somebody else liked it, too, and they took the logo, and they started using it for their own company. And so this is a company out of California, I think, Moxie Communica Communications Group, and they stole my logo. And I was kind of pissed about it. And so I emailed the, the owner of the company. I was like, you stole my logo. Turns out she had asked somebody in her company to design the logo. She, they had told her that it was original work. It ended up they just copied my logo and said it was their work. Uh, they were real nice about it. We didn't have to get the lawyers involved in this one. And they, they changed their logo. Uh, and they were very apologetic. Uh, secondly, there was a... There's a company that used to be called Ingenera, N-G-E-N-E-R-A, and um, they decided to rename the company from Ingenera to Moxie Software, or Moxie. Uh, they are a pretty big size company. They do some other online stuff. If you do a search for Moxie Software, this is the one that's going to show up, not my company. Um, but they actually called me and said, hey, we want to buy the domain Moxie Software. We'll give you $10,000 and 10,000 shares of our worthless stock. I said, no, I'm going to keep it. And I said, I have the domain, and you can't take it, and it's my name, too. You can't take the name. Well, so they sent a cease and desist letter. to. They went ahead and renamed the company Moxie. They got, like, Moxie, I forgot what their domain is, uh, gomoxie.com is what they ended up going with. Um, I still get lots of emails from people at moxie.com. But anyway, their lawyers decided to send me a cease and desist because now they thought, oh, we're going to register the Moxie software name, and we're going to get a trademark with it. And uh, guess what? That's what they exactly they did. They went ahead and filed for a trademark on Moxie software. Well, there was already people using the name, like me. And there actually is another company uh, out of the UK that filed the trademark for Moxie Software uh, like 10 or 15 years ago. And it actually had prior authorization, prior trademark to Moxie Software. What ended up happening is they got their trademark application denied, so they can't get a trademark on Moxie Software. I can't get a trademark on Moxie Software. And they don't have the domain box software. I have it. So they lost, and yeah, whatever. So, but that's a pain in the ass. The lawyers are not fun. So, chapter. I kind of went through, and I mentioned the lawyers and some other stuff. And for those of you who are young and still influential or impressionable, um, I was married. A while ago, and my co-founder of the company Moxie Software actually decided to be my wife at the time. And there's a re so there was a time when I decided I wanted to try and fundraise to get some VC funding for the company. And we met with several VCs, and they all pretty much said the same thing: we don't fund husband and wife teams. Well, there's a reason why they don't fund husband and wife teams. It's because they get divorced, and it's a bigger mess than anything else. So. Uh, that happened to me, and, and the company kind of went through like a three, four-year legal battle, and I ended up with the company, but I took it as a great opportunity to kind of hit the reset button and say, yeah, let's start. This. What happened is I decided to start a new company, Spike May Software. Um, some people ask where I got the name Spike May. Uh, I collect a few things in life. I like cufflinks and... Uh, what else do I collect? Um, 
eyeglasses, and domain names. And a while ago, a few years ago, I you just buy domain names for their really good deal and they're kind of cool. And on eBay, I found I got spikemace.com for like six bucks off an eBay auction. This is a great domain name, but I have no idea what I'm going to use it for. And I sat on it a few years, and then when I was trying to think of a company name, I was going through my do domain list, and I was like, that's it. It has to be Spike Mace software. And that's where I... You can't have a name like Spike, Spike Mace without... Without actually having a Spike Mace. And so, yeah, the funnest, the funnest thing was actually getting the Spike Mace from Spike Mace software. I do kind of keep it covered up when I'm walking on campus. I, cause, yeah, security doesn't always like to see it. I was giving a presentation at uh, the Microsoft store in Woodland Hills Mall one time, and mall security got on to me because they have a big glass window there. And so I you know, kept in the bag, walked into the store. But the, yeah, they, I got to stay, but they were not happy about it. <laughs> So I think it's a great name for a, for a company, and so I named it uh, Spike Mace Software. And I decided to take all kind of my experience with um, Twilio, and and um, along the way I've done uh, kind of freelance or custom software development for companies, and, and I've written a couple of uh, call tracking applications for some companies, like two almost identical just companies out of the blue saying, hey, we need call tracking. You know, we, have a number we want to see who calls it. And so I decided to take that and, and kind of, yeah, do my own product. So my first product that I released is Spike Mace, a simple call tracker, which is, you know, exactly what it does. You go and you get a phone number, you can advertise that phone number, and you point it to an existing number, a business number, and then you get a record of everybody who called and the duration of the calls and things like that. So, um, so that was the first product. I kept Diner Connection. Uh, transferred that to Spike Mace, and so that Diner Connection is still the biggest product I have. Uh, it's in restaurants across the U.S. and Canada still. Um, Skyflash had kind of, I don't want to say fizzled out, but it never got some traction, never got traction like Diner Connection uh, did. And so we decided to try our hand at a accelerator program with Skyflash. And uh, so we actually got accepted into Betablocks, which is a Kansas City-based accelerator. They opened up an office in Tulsa. And so we went through accelerator program for Scott Flash and ended up kind of rebranding, refocusing that on the general business market. And so it's yeah, a little less flashy, a little more focused towards business. So we'll see how that goes. Um, still have artists and bands using it mostly. So we're not a really good, uh, have not fit or found our right product market fit. We're working on it. So one of the things that I really valued, you know, doing startups is the community aspect of it and getting to know other startup founders and people working in startups and, and networking. And some of the ones that have really helped me along the way, uh, things like I2E, which is a, an Oklahoma-based um, agency that gets funding from the state and they you know, get funding from the state and invest it and, and uh, help things out uh, that way. Uh, one Million Cups, I know they have, they might have one here in Stillwater. Uh, I'm not sure, but it's a weekly uh, startup thing where people come and give talks and then people ask questions. They have like two startup companies a week. Um, Tulsa's dropped down to like once a month now. But Ignite Tulsa and OKC, they're not really technology-based things, but uh, I've met some great people through there. I've given presentations at uh, both OKC and, and uh, Tulsa. I've been a speaker at TEDx Tulsa uh, a few years ago, and then Open Beta uh, doesn't exist anymore. But just getting out there, and whenever you have an app or have, have an idea, and getting out there in front of people and meeting other people and spreading the word about your product, and that's been one of the other yeah, key things getting to other people who have similar ideas. And, um, yeah, so that's kind of where, I guess, professionally, like business-wise, I'm at a uh, startup. Um, to bring business to anybody who wants them. But I did kind of, I know I was mentioned that I uh, did get uh, a distinguished alumni from OSU for computer science. And that got me thinking that there's always something out there that I 
was um, not happy with. That was the extent of my education. I had uh, got my computer science degree. I've, I've gone back. It's been about 10 years ago now. I got my MBA. Uh, but I was missing something. And, and the uh, award kind of encouraged me to get back into what I was missing, and that was going back for my PhD. So actually, I'm in my second semester now. Uh, I applied for the PhD program at the University of Tulsa, and so now I'm a PhD student uh, full time at the University of Tulsa. Um, so I'm really enjoying it. Uh, my focus is in cybersecurity. I don't know, I see one guy with a Bitcoin hat. Anybody see me like the news? Was it last week or the week before about the um, the price, artificial price inflation in Bitcoin several years ago. That was from my uh, group at the University of Tulsa and the guy, one of the co-authors, I sit next to him and uh, the, the author of the paper, uh, Dr. Moore, is my advisor. So that's kind of, he was doing a uh, cryptocurrency investigation and I'm doing more. Right now I'm doing a business compromise investigation so people can try to get companies to do wire transfers and steal information from companies. That's where I'm focusing on right now. It's been yeah, really fun. So that's kind of wrapping up. I also have another email address if you want to see my personal email uh, there. So now is the question and answer part. I'm kind of done with the, the dog and pony show. So, yes. So after all of your diverse experience, uh, what did you choose to go into for grad school? Um, well, um, I don't want to say I didn't get to pick, but uh, TU is one of a, a, um, a big into cybersecurity, mm -hmm. and the research assistantship that was available was in cybersecurity, and so I'm not opposed to doing any cybersecurity research. Um, I, I definitely wanted to go PhD in computer science, and I struggled when I decided to get a master's degree 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, whether I should go master's in computer science or MBA. And at the time, it was before I started my companies, but I knew that I wanted to have my own software company. And that was kind of my goal. So at the time, I felt the MBA was more important to me, and I think I made the right decision at that time, but I still wanted to go further in my computer science education. And um, I've, had, I've had great experience, uh, I don't want to say some success, with running my own companies. And for me, I made a terrible employee. And so doing this really allows me to, uh, doing my own companies allows me to do what I'm best at. And I still do you know, freelance work for companies and do yeah, what I'm really good at. And what I'm really good at is uh, full, full stack web application development. Um, and that's what they came into mostly. And the good thing is that I'll get, yeah, I'll tell you a question, but uh, like Diner Connection, um, going more into what type of products, if you're wanting to do like a startup for your first one or trying it out. Uh, I believe in the SaaS model, there's software as a service where people pay you every month. Because I wrote Diner Connection like in 2009, the majority of it, I've added functionality and features since then, but uh, I get lots of money every month for something I did years ago. They keep giving me money every month, and that's what's awesome about the SaaS model can find that niche product and get people to use it and get people to give you money every month. It's an awesome thing. And then you can sit on your ass and do what you really want to do instead of working all the time. But yeah, it takes hard work to get there, but it's full of work. How do you think you'll take a uh, software development into like uh, cybersecurity? You know, I'm doing a lot of um, a lot of my research, I do I deal a lot with data and so I'm getting into uh, a lot more Python programming to parse the data and start looking at um, how the data correlates. So I'm getting into some data science stuff because I'm using R to do analysis on the data. And so my skills are valued because I yeah, have a lot of, lot of progr practical programming knowledge. And in the academic environment, um, at least with the grad, with a lot of them haven't gone into the real world yet, and so they don't have a lot of practical programming experience, 
at that level. And so somebody like me who has a lot of practical programming experience can jump into this research pro project and really start adding value by being able to code. Um, yeah, because some some people, if some of the graduate students, uh, you know, the only time they create the database was in their database class. It can't happen. Or somebody only has created, you know, dozens and dozens of databases and all sorts of stuff. So just experience-wise and doing all the research and, you know, and things like writing web scrapers with things like that. It's easier when you know, in the past. Is that any questions? Yeah. All right. Well, good. So if somebody's goal is like for their for their grad school and doing research or something, would you recommend spending some time in the industry before you go there? I think it's valuable. Um, absolutely. It, uh, it it's not the right choice for everybody, uh, depending on what type of research you're going into. Uh, but I think it's having real world experience is, is important. Um, we're lucky. I don't know how many are from Oklahoma or the Midwest in general. Uh, but we don't have enough software developers in the Midwest, in Oklahoma, and so you can stay here and work, like just a guaranteed job, uh, but there's lots of programming jobs in the Midwest that are not, it's not going to be in decline. Uh, so get a job for a while, go back to school for a while, if that sounds good, and you'll make some money instead of, you know, earning just the, the research assistant salary. That is your question. Yeah. I enjoy both, and that's my struggle too, because I like, you know, running companies, and I'm able to do that still while going to school. I love going to school and learning and doing research. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, well, okay. So, so you talked about like practical coding skills. Mm -hmm. So. And it's, it's probably clear, you know, I can say as a professor, we don't teach it very well in, in, uh, to our undergraduates, maybe. And so how, let's say, you know, I'm an undergraduate and I want to jumpstart that kind of thing, what do I do? Yeah, and I struggle with that too. Um, I think the most, I've said it before, but I think the most important thing you learn as a computer science student is learning how to learn mm -hmm. and learning how to figure things out because that's what you're going to run into in the real world is that you're not going to be able to know every development framework. You're not going to be able to learn everything. So you have to learn how to learn those mm -hmm. new things. You have to learn how to jump into a new framework and a new language. You have to learn, you know, get the wires in your head right so it's, you know, you know how to code. And learning new languages is learning the syntax. Mm -hmm. And that's, to me, what's valuable in the computer science uh, curriculum. And it's, and the core things are important, you know, learning from the operating system design up to data structures mm -hmm. and um, theory of computing, because that all makes you a better computer scientist and it makes you a better <coughs> software developer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the best software developers I've had working for me have that formal education, have that computer science degree, even doing web application development. The ones that are self-taught or didn't go to school don't have that depth of knowledge that they can apply to even things like web application development. So I, mean, I think it's a mindset that they get, they get taught and they learn. Which stack do you typically use for the web application development? You know, and I, I started out doing um, Microsoft stack, and so a lot of my apps are in Microsoft stack, uh, just because that's what I knew at the time. And uh, yeah, so I, I do other, I've worked on other stacks as well. But uh, for me, when I sit down, I know how to work with database and SQL Server, and I know ASP.NET and C. Uh, I started out being a C and C++ Unix developer, and so I still do, I mean, I have a Mac and you know, use Linux and all that stuff. So I still have a strong base in C and C++ development. Um, I've been doing C Sharp and ASP.NET and C. 
and Microsoft SQL Server, or if you MySQL or Python and Django and others. So I don't really have a good recommendation. If you want to go pick one, just pick one. Pick one you like and learn it because yeah, just pick it. So, I don't care. And my customers don't care what I use either. I've not had one customer ask me what technology stack to use for Dynatrace. Nope. Because it doesn't matter to them. It's just as long as it works, fine. It doesn't matter. Just do it. Anyone else? Any, any last questions? Okay, uh, well, I'll, I'll, yeah, sorry. I'll ask one. Right, I basically asked from a student's perspective. Uh -huh. but, yeah. So here's from a teacher's perspective, right? Uh, yeah, well, what do you think as, you know, as ES instructors we should be doing differently than we are? Maybe I should ask you. <laughs> okay, well, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's, um, yeah, yeah, it's tough because I was talking to one of my advisor who mm -hmm. had a programming assignment, and it happened to be for uh, e-commerce e -commerce security class. But the project was in um, it's a Python Tornado web framework, which nobody, I mean, not a very popular one, and. He was saying, well, what, you know, should I give a whole primer on this tornado framework? I was like, no, I, I said the same thing. The most important thing is learning how to figure stuff out. Um, I don't want to say professors give too much information to students, but that's, in computer science, you know, my job day in, day out was, was problem solving. And so the more problems I have to solve, the more things I get to figure out on my own. Yeah. More and I, and I certainly feel yeah. like, yeah. That I'm probably not balancing as the amount of information that I'm giving them at, at, at a very detailed level, but probably I'm giving them too much at a detailed level a lot of times. Um, so all of the better. <laughs> and and uh, but yeah, it's but it's hard. I mean, it's hard. I guess as a professor, it's hard to you know if a student comes to you and asks about a specific problem. And you know they probably won't figure it out on their own. It's hard not to answer them. Or, it is. Or if you suspect. Yeah, right? I know. And I, yeah, because I know people who, as hard as they, as they <clears throat> try, they're just not going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Because they're just not right in their, not right in their head. They don't get right the wires. They don't, yeah, I mean, not in a bad way, but they just don't think like they've tried and in Korean classrooms. They just don't care. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I get, yeah. I guess sometimes I think, I'm like, because I, I teach the CS1 and class, and I'm like, I, well, it's I a hope media, a lot of yeah. the people who come to me at that level self-select for, for going to something else. Well, and that's, I mean, that's what CS1 is for. Mm -hmm. But how many, so you're mostly computer science undergrads? How many of you took AP computer science tests to get credits AP, like in high school? Yeah. I mean, we just barely even talk about giving people credit for that. Yeah. Cause, I mean, we and we don't get very many people requesting. Because I remember I took, yeah, I took it and got out of CS1. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody took CS1. Yeah. It's a weed out class. And so that's, I don't want to say you, you have to just. And, and you guys work yeah. the weed. You were the, yeah. You were the, it the real Congratulations. Plan. I didn't switch to is this a weed that's an exotic plant? It's a plant growing somewhere you don't want it to grow, yeah. and that's all weed is. But, yeah. but it is growing. It's great. Yeah, it is growing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's. Joking out the rest of it. Yeah. So, that's a tough, tough one to say because those are concepts that in, in CS1 that the, that's a foundation mm -hmm. class, and if they don't get it, they don't get it. Mm -hmm. They don't, yeah, they should self select. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I don't know. Don't have a good answer. Okay. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll I be in those either. shoes. I don't either. Yeah. What? Yeah. I don't know. Available? <laughs> I, I, I hear that. I hear that. Yeah. I don't know. More participation focused. 
Looks like we have a question from Wes. Yeah. Oh, we have a question. Asked if it was a functioning mate. It is. And my kids and I have like, taken it in the backyard and like bashed up trees with it. It's not a very good one because it's not very sharp and they don't stand very well. But, but, yeah. So it is functional. I mean, yeah, if you get the money, it would look really, really bad. It could actually cause Might grave go. damage. Yeah. Yeah, can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you buy the mate? I think I got it at eBay. Uh, <laughs> or where do you get anything? Quote eBay. eBay. If it's not on Amazon, I'm going to eBay. So, yeah. So, eBay. You have to buy it. That's right. Dude, I just haven't found the spike No, no, the spike may not play on eBay. Jeez. That was yeah. a good one. Anything else? Plenty yeah. cookies and stuff for us. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, oh, Mr. Welcome. Simpson. Yeah. You don't have to use them. You don't have to take them card. Do you have other questions or anything? You guys have other stuff to talk about? Uh, yeah, just uh, some stuff in the vein of announcements. Uh, so next week we're going to be giving, or we're, we're going to be doing tours of um, Dr. Cecil's lab. Do you, do you know what Dr. Cecil's lab is called? I don't know the official name of it. Um, Cyber physical systems. Yeah, so we're doing a tour of the cyber physical systems lab uh, that is upstairs room 316. Uh, we haven't entirely worked out the kinks of that yet, uh, but the gist is that 10 people at a time will be allowed. We're going to, I guess, try to work on stuff for people who are outside the lab at, at that time. Uh, but that is our plan for next week. We're going to be talking about what they do in that lab. It's a lot of really cool stuff uh, in the vein of kind of internet of things and virtual reality uh it's a lot of really cool stuff and we're excited to be showing you the lab uh let's see i, I guess another thing to talk about do we know the date of the programming competition it's like february 21st it would be the 21st because the 14th is one of our meetings and we gather that okay yeah february 20 uh 21st, we're doing the three-hour programming competition. We're excited about that. Uh, we're, we're lining up uh, that competition. So that'll be here that day. Um, another thing this semester, uh, March 3rd through 4th, uh, OU is putting on a hackathon called Hacklahoma. And we are very excited to hopefully be bringing delegates to Hacklahoma. But for us to do that, we need delegates. Uh, so if you're interested in, over the course of a 24-hour period, building programs with your friends? You can call it Dynamic Connect. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you might get sued. Two Diner, two say, Connection, yeah. uh, Diner Connection 2, Electric Boogaloo, uh, <laughs> Diner Connection 2, the second one. Um, if you haven't been to Hackathon, they're really fun. I mean, it, yeah, I really enjoy them. And they you get to meet lots of cool people, and that's one of the things you take away is, is to meet with people, too. Yeah, it's fun. Whatever you do, it'll probably crap. That's all right. It's fun getting to do it. But it's crap you can put on your resume, too. That's right. uh, and even if you aren't entirely satisfied with the quality of your crap, um, you in your interviews, you know, your interviewer is going to ask you, like, write about a time you, or not write, but tell us about a time you failed. And you can say, well, I participated in a hackathon, and here's what we tried to do, here's what we learned as a result. So either you make some great shiny crap or you make some crappy crap that you can spin <laughs> as shiny in some way. Um, well, in that thing, you don't have to give evidence. That's true. Uh, so yeah, hackathons are just really productive diarrhea. Um, <laughs> Especially if you drink too much caffeine. Yes. So if, um, if productive diarrhea sounds like it's right up your alley, Come to us. Come to Norman with us. We're excited. Um, I am. I am. Uh, but if, if you're if you're actually really interested in participating in Hackahoma with us, though, I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, they've been organizing it for like the past year, uh, so we want to show them what we've got. Uh, get in touch with me or any of the other officers, um, and we'll start signing y'all up because I think the deadline to sign up is sometime in February. Um, but yeah, that's, that's stuff that we're really excited about. Uh, any last minute 
thoughts, questions. HGMW is happening, right? Kara Brown, do you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, we're going to meet in Brian and Nikki. We're going to talk to you about his experience in Rome, specifically in terms of opportunity for um, people of minorities, which can be that can be many different things, can get experience and mentorship into the corporate world. And so everyone's welcome. You don't have to be a female to become. And so I think it's just going to have to be a hell of a thing. All right. Uh, that's here, 6.30, right? Cool. Uh, there are snacks. There are plenty of snacks. Please take snacks. Uh, thank you all for showing up. We'll see you all next week. Again, we're going to be uh, in room 316 for that. Um, have a good one.